Welcome to Voices in Value-Based Care. I'm Beth Hauck. Thanks for tuning in. The movement to value-based care is revolutionizing how healthcare providers get reimbursed for delivery of care. In this program, we're going to explore stories from the field about how real organizations are dealing with this change. You can follow the show on Twitter at hashtag Voices in BBC and follow me on Twitter at BA Hauck. On the program today, I talk to my team members, Erica Arias and Chris Long from SA Ignite. Chris and Erica, welcome to the show. Thank you, good to be here with you, Beth. Thanks, Beth, happy to be here. So this is always fun when I get to talk to my colleagues. So the perspective that we're bringing today is based on user group sessions that we had with our customers over the past couple months. So the, the topic of the user group sessions was how to make MIPS a change enabler for value-based care. One of the things that we've observed working with our customers over some time now is they've put a lot of time, effort, resources, mental energy into the MIPS program. And we feel like that payoff needs to be bigger than what it is right now. So one of the things that this program obviously is exploring is how you transition to value-based care. And so one of those key ways you transition is by working on programs like MIPS that help you establish that change and help kind of start with that foundation. So that was the concept of our user group sessions. That's what we were trying to, to achieve. You know, Chris, what did you think about that topic when you first went into, when we first kind of launched it, what did you think was going to be the reaction from our customers? I thought it was going to be a very interesting concept because we have heard a lot over the last year or so that it is really difficult to do um, MIPS and to do meaningful use. And the result that people are getting from it isn't necessarily worth the effort that they're putting into it. And so where can they put their efforts that it'll be spread out other over other programs or things like that? Um, so I was really interested to hear if people were thinking along those lines or if they were just stuck in the mindset of it's just hard. It's just something we have to do and we're going to slog through it as best we can. So that was what I was looking forward to. And I was able to participate in the Chicago session. So um, we had some really nice reactions during that meeting, which we'll get to later. So Erica th got to participate in a in the Albany session that we had. So for some of for some of our East Coast customers. So I think what's fun about talking to both Chris and Erica is that they participated in two different sessions. So I'm excited to hear your perspectives differently than that. Um, so Erica, same question to you. When you heard about the topic and you reckon and you work with our customers all the time, what did you think? You know, did you think it was going to work? I did. I think mainly because one of the things that we hear consistently from our customers is that they're looking for a community. They want to understand how other people are managing any of the programs they participate in and how they are using the relationships and the programs to get to gain success in other um, areas. And I think that, you know, across our customer base, we have small organizations to large healthcare systems. And there were so many similarities in the types of questions and the things they were looking for that it was obvious there is a need to have other people to sort of bounce ideas off of and learn from, um, you know, rather than recreate the wheel, so to speak. So we started our day with a exercise. We asked people a little bit about what keeps them up at night, a little bit about their backgrounds. Um, but we also asked them to take a little sticker and put it on a chart and tell us whether they saw MIPS in their organization as a change enabler or whether or not they saw their um, saw the organization saw MIPS more as a um, compliance program, something that just had to happen. And we wanted to see kind of what the starting point was for our customers. It's kind of starting with you, Erica. What what was your reaction or what did you notice, I should say, about the customers when they responded to this exercise? Um, so, I, I mean, I think that 
there's always the observation of seeing how other people are placing <laughs> their their circles that gives an element of overthinking and where are you <laughs> truly at but um we had three very different organizations and they really felt like they were in the middle so leaning more towards more towards it being a change enabler but not a hundred percent there so there was certainly opportunity they felt there was opportunities to increase how they were using the mips program um, to participate in other value-based care programs um, but they were not just um, using it as compliance their organization that really at this point um, mips is their value-based care program, um, and there are no others. So it was interesting to see how comfortable they felt in this space um, and how they thought they could use it to leverage potentially other programs to participate in. I was struck actually, especially in your session, Erica, the, the notion of, yeah, we, we saw it as an opportunity to open the door and start to have conversations with clinicians about, look guys, we're gonna be measured on this stuff. You better start to get on board. I, I, I found that to be um, unique really amongst, uh, amongst the organizations that we had talked to that up until that point. Yes, they definitely, it was almost um, like the audience members we had could see the vision um, very easily and where they were looking for help was how to relay that vision to other people within the organization. So I think one of the feedback, one of the big things of feedback that we heard was this it being an opportunity because we're so in the weeds every day, day to day, to look, to take a step back and look and, sh and see like this is an opportunity to be, to increase our participation in value-based care programs. Um, we just need to know which levers to pull within our organization to get everyone else on board. And that's the tricky part. Chris, yes. did you see the yeah. same thing? Did you see people in the middle or sure. on one or other side of the spectrum? Yeah, we were a little bit different. In the Chicago session, the table that I was sitting at, we really started with the dots a lot closer to the compliance end. Um, people were interested, and certainly by the end of the day, I think they had gotten there, but really started on the compliance end for sure. And, uh, you know, feeling like this is something that somebody above me has told me I have to do, and I'm going to do it to the best of my ability, but, you know, this program is going to end in a couple of years, and then I'm going to have to adapt to something else, and it changes every year, and so it's very complicated. So um, a lot of it had to do with just making sure that they were doing it right and not necessarily seeing where the, the larger opportunities were. But certainly over the course of the day, which I know we're gonna talk about, um, they really got closer to that idea of, wow, you know, this isn't just something that I have to do. Well, I think one of the things that was kind of fun was, you know, you don't, you, you can't orchestrate what people's responses are going to be. So you have to kind of react to where their starting point is and then see whether or not the content that we, really believe in and had to deliver could be useful to their starting point. And so I think by and large, um, having people have this revelation that, wow, I never even kind of considered MIPS as something that could be used as more than just a compliance program or, and, or, and that it could play such a role in being foundational was, was fun to see. That evolution was fun to see. Um, I think one of the things that that we had happened through, through the day. So one of so some of the exercises were looking at what does MIPS do right now, and how could we use some of the elements of what we're doing to run that program for the future. So and then based on what the future needed to look like, where were the gaps between where we're at right now and what the future needed to be. So in that gap analysis, there were consistencies no matter which session you were at and one was this what we broadly say is the relationship to the finance department so when I introduced this concept to a few people I said I remember you know in the meaningful use days people would say oh yeah I'm gonna get most of my providers to meaningful use and give a number to finance and that's that was the the extent of the interaction you know like oh, I'm gonna get 10 and this is how much money you're gonna earn so that they could budget for that and now suddenly we have value-based care contracts that are 
designed to have you meet specific measures and you have this quality department that has to get to meet those measures and what we were surprised to learn was how big the gap between the communication of those two groups was tell me chris though, how did you start tell me a little bit more about what you heard relative to that gap yeah i think one of the participants one of the participants was really talking about his concern that there were so many silos in the organization that quality isn't talking to finance and operations doesn't know what population health is focused on and it was his feeling that nobody even was talking to the people that were in um, the managed care department that were negotiating these value-based care contracts so the idea of certain things getting solidified into different programs without the full buy-in of everyone that was participating that was a real concern and everybody agreed with that 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 was really something that um, had been an issue for them and the idea that they have this this responsibility for a large program but not everybody understands it and not everybody is is fully bought into why it's important and things like that um, the idea of just trying to educate the people around them as well as getting their buy-in was one of the um, the challenges that people really wanted to tackle during that day. I found it to be somewhat um, an aspirational point too, you know, like, yeah. hey, we, we immediately see that gap. But we also immediately see how we could start to bridge it. Mm -hmm. I think, Erica, in your session, you had some people a little further down the path that were using MIPS as a rallying cry a bit more what how did did any of those organizations talk about how they also collaborate with finance differently right now to to start to build those bridges or did they too talk about this same gap the majority still had the gap although they had experimented a little on getting uh the involvement and in collaboration within um, the organization and finance uh, the most unique was putting the MIPS program manager across the hall from finance, uh, <laughs> which was oh. highly uh, and did not necessarily play out how they had hoped. Um, but the one that had really seemed the most, has seen the most success was uh, using Dyad leadership and the MIPS program manager was meeting with finance um, walking through what to forecast and how to forecast that and really their component that they were missing um, that they've started to integrate in is the physician being involved in those meetings as well. So taking all sort of all three uh, contributors and holding one another accountable um, with weekly touch points. Yeah, I I could uh, I could see how even the geography <laughs> of having mm -hmm. them across the hall could make make a, a big difference. But all of those other things uh, are also important. I think it I think it really lends itself also to the to another aspect of the conversation we had when we were talking about gaps was that in many organizations MIPS was still a person, not a program. So. Just like anything, you know, they heard about macro and MIPS. A lot of organizations says, I need, I need my MIPS person. I need to hire for this. I need to have that person in place so that they can be all things MIPS. And what that ended up doing was creating MIPS was a person, not a program. That person leaves and you, your whole uh, infrastructure related to operationalizing that, you know, compliance program kind of crumbles. So Erica, launching off that conversation about the about kind of the finance and finance silo, what do what do you think it what do you think it means to make MIPS a person, not a program, and how have you seen some organizations do this successfully? Um, so I, I mean, I think the biggest change is using what's the common denominator across everything that you're doing in the organization to be successful. So it's patient care and how are you managing um, whether that care is you know, high quality. So there were similarities across any program you participate in and looking um, 
and looking at those similarities and then making that sort of the language that you're using in your organization. So instead of saying these are our MIPS measures, these are the measures we're focused on to improve the quality of care for our customers. That way, whether it's the person so you know responsible for MIPS or responsible for VBC program A, B, or C, they're still speaking the same language. Yeah, we did have some conversations about that language. That was that was in my own like aha that how much that was important to them. Yes. Yeah, it, it's it's huge. I mean, we're all filled with acronyms, and I think we we know <laughs> we notice it across any program that that we help customers um, gain success is that we're all talking about the same thing, just using different words. And if you can get those words <laughs> to all be the same, um, you'll have a lot more success uh, in collaboration. And, and frankly, you know, in some ways. You, you you might gain a little bit by not using the MIPS four letter word, you know. <laughs> yes. um, At least because, from a position position perspective, well, certainly. Uh, yeah, because they, they don't want to hear about another government program, but they do want to perform better in quality and they want people to measure that and, and tell the world about it. So yes. that's all good. So let's, let's start from that standpoint in, instead. Um, what do, you, what do you think, Chris? I, I recall very clearly at the Chicago Forum, somebody, uh, I can't remember exactly, but I can remember like their smile, you know, saying like, oh, I never thought about it. MIPS really, really does need to be a program, not a person, because obviously they, they were that person and recognized how much that was holding them back. So mm -hmm. what do you think resonated the most about that concept? I think the timing was just perfect, actually, because two of the customers that we had there, um, one of the customers had just lost their main resource that, you know, that resource who I had been in close contact with throughout 2018, her last day was coming up in a week from the day of the forum. And so, you know, her manager was here at the forum like, ah, what am I going to do to run this program now if this person is gone? And so, you know, that was, I think, the complete light bulb that he needed more people than just that one resource. And the other customer that was um, sitting at the same table had literally just formed a new quality committee within the last few months. And so they recognized that they have 11 different value based programs that they have been working on. And there had been one resource who had been very focused on um, MIPS and also on meaningful use for Medicaid, but you know, largely just focused on MIPS, and they were cut off from the other 10 value-based care programs. And I don't know exactly what it was that, that drove the change with their organization, but once they saw, oh, if we just put one person over all the quality programs, and like Erica was talking about, we do start speaking the language of quality measures and objective measures and things that we can actually count and track and see on scorecards, that these are things that are going to benefit our patient population overall. And it's not just something that we're doing to get a score and to have, you know, like a nice bright check mark on, you know, physician compare at the end of the year, that it really is something that you can look at the organizational priorities and decide what is it that we value the most that we want to focus on and maybe which quality measures or things like that are going to reflect that if we focus on them this year. And that's really only a perspective that you can get when you have a group of people together that are talking about it regularly. And that's where having that quality program instead of just a compliance person whose job it is to run reports, you know, that's where the value is really going to come from. And I think by the end of the day, all seven of the organizations that we had participating, especially in the Chicago um, forum, they were really, um, they were pretty sold at that point, which was great. Yeah, I, I would say a really important thing out of that too, Chris, was the approach. So why approach a physician and tell them it's important to MIPS? Mm -hmm. yeah. Approach and talk to them that it's important to patient care. Um, mm -hmm. And you'll immediately have a better response than mm -hmm. I'm just doing this to check a box. Um, mm -hmm. Because it makes the why far more important. And that 
is uh, a big, big driver for motivation is the why. Mm -hmm. Right. We did. I mean, we did talk a lot about that. You know, that's the, the soft side, but really the crux of all of this is how do you how do you drive the change? And one of the tactics for driving the change was, like we said, not like moving it away from being this very person tied to the name MIPS program and making it or a uh, person and making it more of a program that everybody can get behind and maybe not using the MIPS term. I think along those lines was a lot of conversations about physician engagement, which Erica, you just started to touch on. How do you, how do you get people to not think they're just checking a box to meet a government program? And I think um, we heard a lot of really great ideas. We had a we had a physician who gave us uh, his perspective, both as a physician, practicing physician, as well as a physician leader who's been down this path. Um, there were all kinds of ahas in, in what he said, but kind of talking about what you were just just talking about, Erica, what did you what did you hear related to that engagement that was particularly compelling? I think uh, for me and and the table I was sitting with in particular, it was the timing is everything um, and um, bringing in physicians after you've made some very critical decisions and how not only they are looked upon with publicly shared information, but also in some cases of their physician compensation to bring um, the physician in after those was too late, mm -hmm. that we really need to um, include those physicians, both the naysayers and the all in immediately so that they can provide that, in, that input um, and honestly be more vested in success because they've contributed to those decisions. Definitely. I think uh, what, what was the, the, the phrase that you and I both loved was turn the, turn the loudest complainer into the leader. Yes. Yes. What a great Very strategy. important. Yeah. <laughs> Very important. Right. Yeah. yeah. Well, if someone's engaged enough to be irritated or loud, <laughs> Rechannel that energy, and I think we had a similar um, similar reactions in Chicago, where the 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 folks who attended were so excited to hear from Dr. Faber about the different things that they could probably do for their physician engagement, and the the I think the biggest point that we saw that there was the biggest reaction to was the idea of really trying to narrow down. Um, all of the tools that are available and all of the different pieces that are moving and everything, that being able to narrow it down for the clinician and say, we're not expecting you to click every box. We're not expecting you to become an expert on any of these um, compliance programs or anything like that. But what we are gonna do is, we're gonna talk to your staff. We're gonna talk to um, your clinical team or something like that so that we can say, look, your staff is going to handle that, and you get to focus on the things that are most important to you, so that you don't overwhelm them with with new requirements or things that they need to be involved with. Um, you know, the busy work can be done by somebody other than a very busy clinician. Mm -hmm. so that 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 alone is probably two more episodes, right? There's a, oh my so gosh, yeah, unpack, unpack <laughs> there. So at the at the end of the user group forum, we asked all of our attendees to tell us about their aha moments. Like what were the things that they were like, I never thought about that. I never considered. I, I'm going to pose the question back to the both of you about your own aha moments, not necessarily about the content, although certainly it could be that, or even just what surprised you about the attendees and some of what they had to say. Erica, I'll let you go first on that. Okay, uh, so two biggest takeaways for me. Uh, the first being the uh, on an island alone. So what sometimes is perceived as, you know, a almost a wish to make sure that they're managing everything by themselves, be, 
for you know whatever reason um it was apparent after meeting you know just for one day across the customers that it was less um a decision they made and more of that's where they were because they didn't have the stakeholders or participation from other um people within their organization so you know how can we how can we give them the tools to go out and and get people to participate so they can be just a contributor not the actual program itself and the second i would say was the approach so the uh, one of the things dr faber talked about was the with them the what's in it for me and how impactful that is for everyone to know why they need to do something um, and that why we're doing it is really to improve patient care. And if you start from there, you can't go wrong, right? Like That's it's, right. it's where we're headed and it's what we all want. So looking at it from, from that approach instead of the tactical, like clinical pieces that we tend to go back to, like, you need to do this measure, you need to check here. Like this is why we're doing it. So yeah, the why we're doing it is so key. Chris, uh, mm-hmm. what, uh, what about you? Yeah, I think the biggest takeaway I came out with was um, really reinforcing how smart and how engaged our customers are and how much they want to take action. That it's, they didn't come to this forum to just learn more theory. They came here to leave with strategies. They really wanted to be able to take something back and put it into action to help their organizations. And that was actually the neatest thing to see, the way that they were connecting with each other. Even if they're in a geographic area that's competing with each other, they still felt like, you know, we really do need to connect. We do need to support each other because this is a hard program and we want, you know, our strategies are aligned, even if we're competitors. Um, And being able to know what the plan is and go forward with it, um, there just felt like a lot of energy to do that. And I was really, I was just really kind of excited to to be in the middle of that and see the excitement and and know that we've got some tools that we can help them, but that they were also just coming up with tons of ideas on their own. And that was really a great feeling. Well, thank you guys both. Always fun to talk to people that I spend lots of time with in the other aspects of my life thanks and thanks to our audience for tuning in you can learn more about the show on the programs page on healthcarenowradio.com and lend your voice to the conversation on twitter at hashtag voices in bbc and be sure to follow me on twitter at ba hauk i'm beth hauk bringing you the voices in value-based care you should hear until next time have a great week